what's up everybody happy hump day wednesday i hope you guys can hear me okay can someone let me know i'm having some glitches with this uh streaming software i had to reboot my computer three times uh so can someone let me know if you can hear me thumbs up is fine a shock uh no middle fingers just you know hey 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 let me know if you can hear me I, or I, I can see me on I, on my phone. So I'm assuming you can see me. Anyway, Aloha Village people. I love it. I love it, Tyson. How's everybody doing this week? Again, hump day, hump day. Um, interesting week yesterday, the news. Uh, first of all, let me just say, guys, you know, I have been following COVID as many of us have. Uh, and and you know these variants of concern uh or these these variants are of concern for pretty much everyone across the world everyone yeah uh, you know if, reputable sources will tell you that we should be very careful that we should be very cognizant of what's happening in other countries in other states we should be cognizant that this BA4, BA5, and and the BA2.75 and 5.11 that's still uh, developing should be of concern. It, it, it's everywhere, every every country, every state, except for Hawaii, right? Um, which is quite troubling. Uh, and we'll get into that tonight with Dr. Lee Altenberg, uh, our good friend, Dr. Lee. Dr. Tim Brown could not make it this week. He is working on some uh, projects with other countries uh, involving HIV studies. So he is not able to make it this week. We hope to have him on next week. But I appreciate you guys jumping on on this uh, Wednesday evening. Uh, it's always good when we have experts on. I am actually really interested in hearing Dr. Altenberg's take on what happened yesterday with the DOH and the DOE lifting the mask mandates from our schools and also lifting the quarantine requirement which i thought was downright stupid but that's just me i'm not a doctor i'm not a nurse not a healthcare person but uh i can read and i can comprehend and it's just baffling to me that no matter what resource you read whether it's the mayo clinic or webmd or any of the the major hospitals, Johns Hopkins, any of these real life experts, <laughs> not politicians, right? Not politicians. You don't listen to politicians. Um, yes, then, quarantine. I, it, we'll get to it tonight. It's going to boil your blood. It did mine, I can tell you, simply because I cannot understand the rationale. You know, if, if they put it out in a way that you could understand, if there was some kind of nexus to their decisions, that, that, that I could understand whether I agree or disagree, you know, I could, I could accept it, but there is no nexus there. There is just stupidity. It really is. And, and if you didn't watch the press conference, you, you should. And listen to Dr. Sarah Kemble, our state epidemiologist. Uh, listen to her spew the garbage that, you know, this is the right time to transition into the, the new normal and, having our kids be normal again in schools. And never mind, we have a friggin' active variant right now in BA4 and more, more specifically BA5 that we haven't even seen the surge yet here in Hawaii. They're all applauding and so happy that the numbers are coming down. Kauai's positivity rate, 21.5%. More than one out of every five people that take a test is positive. And they're celebrating. Yeah, new landscapes. Thanks, George. Yeah, you're a much better, uh, you have better memory than I. The new landscape. Really, what landscape are you talking about? About kids getting sick? About teachers getting sick? Staff getting sick? And the HSTA, they're, they're all, you know, concerned. Well, they're not that concerned, right? They endorse Josh Green, who's been pushing for this for a very long time. You know, it's, I don't get it. These people are concerned. If I was, if I'm HST, I tell the teachers stay home. Don't go to work. I mean, it's not a safe environment if you're removing the, the masks. I mean, come on, people, you know. 
they ask all the political candidates. I'm pissed. It's really irritating. All these forums they're having these debates. Every single one of them. Nah, it should be optional. Nah, we shouldn't. We shouldn't. It should be a parent's choice. Well, what if it's my my choice for my kid to go to school without a shirt? What if my school, uh, my choice as my parent of my child, feels that it's okay for my kid to go school with with no slippers and 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 shorts and or my daughter to wear a, a bikini? What if that's my choice as a parent? I mean, come on, guys. It's it's the the lobby, the 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 special interest, the political pressure got to all these people, and that's what frustrates me because we are you know, we are making political decisions for our health and safety of our kids and our and our teachers, and, and it's pathetic. I mean, they they will send your kid home if he's not wearing the uniform, or she's not wearing a uniform shirt, because that's mandatory. It's 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 it, but the quarantine rule is even more ridiculous. The the quarantine at first I thought I heard it wrong, so I went back and watched it again, and then I went back and watched it again, and I I, I was not mistaken. This is what the Department of Health is saying. If your child, if your child is a close contact or is exposed to a COVID positive person outside of school. So like your home at the park, at the beach or at a party, then they must quarantine for five days. If the same child or his classmate is exposed to a positive COVID-19 patient, student, whatever it is, but the exposure happened in school, there is no quarantine requirement. They must report back to school. Okay, somebody, somebody. We got a lot of people. We got 73 people watching live. 77 is climbing. I hope Dr. Altenberg comes on. He's usually on by now. Somebody, you guys, there's a lot of smart people. Can someone explain to me what's the logic? What is the logic? There is no logic. There's absolutely no logic. They they asked the question, what's the difference? She couldn't answer because there is no answer, right? COVID is COVID. Why do you catch it at home, at school? But this is their the new landscape. And I don't believe, I, I cannot believe what I heard that this is how they're going to move forward starting August 1st. So if your kid, someone shows up in school and they're sick and they send them home, they test them, they're positive, all of the close contacts report back to school. No quarantine. But if that child happens to have been exposed to COVID at home, uh, that person needs to stay home. It just absolutely makes no sense. Absolutely makes no sense. I, I don't know. I'm not getting any worried. Well, this is Dr. Altenberg. What's going on, Dr. Altenberg? I was having a lot of issues with my um, the stream tonight. I'm, I'm not sure why. Hang on. Let me let me uh, check them out here. Hang on, hang on, hang on. He may have forgotten. Maybe he's so upset that uh, I'll just shoot him a quick message. Oh, there he is. Oh, boy, I tell you, he had me a little worried. I'm actually sweating. I'm actually sweating. He had me a little worried there. I was thinking, you know, I can only rant and rant and rant for so long um i, I need i need an expert tonight i need an expert <laughs> but anyway um what happens if the parent keeps the child i i mean you know they're saying that the child must go to school if the exposure was in school so anyway 
I don't know. We 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 got Dr. Lee Altenberg. He's he's kind of an expert. You know, he knows this stuff front to back, top to bottom. Um, we had we had, and we'll start off talking about the numbers. We talked a little bit about how the state is so excited that the numbers are coming down. You know, they make it very clear. It's been going down for the for six straight weeks. Um, and and they're 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 correct, but you know, so has testing. Uh, and 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 that's I think you know they, you know, we still had a lot of deaths over the last week. Yeah, not as many as we had last week, but the fact of the matter is that there is a lot of virus in our state. There is a lot of uh, variant virus, BA4, BA5, and the threat of new variants coming in, actually already here. But Doc. Why don't we start with, uh, first of all, thank you for jumping on, man. I was getting a little worried. I thought, uh oh, so you can sorry. disregard my last email. It was uh, a sorry. panic email. Oh, sorry. Very sorry, Mel. Uh -oh. I, uh, uh, yeah, it was two minutes uh, late coming uh, on. Can you hear me? No, no, that's fine. That's fine. I, I, I don't, you're coming in a little choppy, and I'm not sure if it's me or you. Mm, all right, let's see here. It may be, it's probably not my system getting Next out. Uh, am I still choppy? Yeah. Yeah, you're very choppy. So let me let me adjust this. Yeah, I, and and it could be my my equipment. I'm not sure. I was having an issue uh, just getting getting logged on tonight, and I know it's the worst night of that it could happen. But that's that's called Murphy's law, right? So can you try again, Doc? I can't I can't hear you. Cannot hear you. I'm not sure what's going on. I'm showing a full full signal. Excuse me guys. So, so sorry. So sorry about the delay. Um Doc, can you hear me? Can you hear me, Doc? I cannot I cannot. Yeah, you can hear me. Okay, you might have to exit out and come back in, and let's see if that works. I right, sorry, folks. My sound did good. Yes, yeah, the, the video is is clear, and we just cannot hear you. Okay, we'll we'll try again. So sorry, so sorry. I really, really, really want to hear from him tonight because see, this guy, and most of you know this, if you've been on our show for any length of time, you know Dr. Altenberg studies the numbers, studies the trends, and what he does is he uses mathematics. He uses mathematics to to basically, you know, there we go. That's okay. Everybody cross your fingers. Aloha. That is so much better. <laughs> okay. That is, that is truly music to my ears, Doc. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Mel, thank you for inviting me on. And uh, boy, it yesterday was the, the, the internet day in hell. Uh, a car at 1 a.m. crashed into uh, two telephone poles in Manoa Valley, knocked one over and split it in two. And uh, the internet was down for 20 hours. Oh. So you started off very, very clear and then I had a little bit of scratchiness. So I'm not sure if I, it's probably. I'm not sure what it is, but yeah, your sound is in intermittent for some reason. How am I now? Any better? Yeah, you're, it's it's choppy. Um, Don, got it. <laughs> Dog got it. <laughs> You came back on. It was nice and loud and clear and uh, it's choppy again. Yeah, there's kind of a try. Can you do it? Try uh, again. Yeah. All right. Something? So it looks like uh, on my, my side, the input volume is all right. Um, okay, you're and, okay uh, now. You're okay. okay. Now. All right. Well. So yeah. So uh, I was I was supposed to. Uh, appear at an online meeting yesterday and I had to find a Wi-Fi hotspot. It was a big mess. So they, the internet's back on. Let's hope uh, the equipment uh, works for us tonight. 
Yeah, there is there is a lag. So I un I understand, um, folks. You guys may see the lag. I'm seeing the lag. Don't worry about it. it. It's not so much what we look like. It's the content. So, um, Doc, let's start off with just yeah. uh, the numbers. It, pretty much what you expected, what you shared with us last week. Um, but what 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 can we expect going forward? And what did what did you see from today's numbers? Okay, well, let let's share the screen here, and. Uh... Let's find this. Here we go. Now, all right, there we go. Can you see it okay? Yes, sir. So here's the numbers. Um, this is for the whole pandemic. And the blue line is the reported case numbers. And these peaks here are for each of these different recent waves. And here we are. And the max of the past week, <clears throat> the max number of cases, I've drawn this line, this orange line, so we can compare it. So we see that it's now fallen below the delta wave. And but it's still, uh, you know, with respect to the delta wave, it's still up in the top part of that. And that's and that's the now in terms of the BA one wave, it's way lower, and I'm I fear that that somehow has set our new our new goalpost for uh, what's acceptable case numbers. Um, so, but it's it's uh, now finally dropped below the peak of the delta wave, but still quite high in terms of that. Um, and take any you know interject with any questions or anything from the the audience um, the more interactive the better um, so but here's the recorded daily tests in Hawaii and here we are um, this past week and if you look at that this is lower than just about the entire the testing for the entire pandemic until we get back um, into 2020. Uh, into the fall of 2020. So our test numbers, our daily tests have dropped below what they were, what they've been for almost two years. So uh, this requires a real, um, uh, you know, we have to re really re uh, profoundly in reinterpret what our current case numbers mean. And um, so here is where I've tried, I've done this formula that uses the positivity rate to predict the case numbers. And this formula works very well in the last, starting in the last half of 2020 and through 21, 21 and um, up until um, the Omicron wave, the BA1 wave peaked and it worked very well coming after that. But then beginning in March, <clears throat> it pulls away. The predicted curve is the orange the actual recorded cases is the blue, and you can see it pulls away, and that's most um, certainly due to the prevalence of home tests, okay? So that people are taking home tests now instead of immediately going to the very easy PCR tests that uh, the, the state was, uh, was offering free. And here, these numbers have stayed strongly divergent uh, ever since. And now um, they're approximately three times the, 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 the case numbers that would be predicted from the current positivity rates are three times what the actual case numbers are. And if we, if we took this orange line as the reality, then you see we're still way above the delta wave here. And we're on, you know, basically this BA2 wave, and I'm including <clears throat> what's called BA2 and the BA2.12.1, which was a subvariant that seems to evolve, have evolved on the U.S. East Coast, and then spread um, to Hawaii and uh, become a big contributor to our case surge. Um, anyway, so. You don't see a heck of a lot of difference between our BA2 wave and our BA1 wave um, in terms of these uh, predicted 
case numbers based on the positivity rates. Now, one thing you notice is the, the BA2, the BA1, boy, it shot up incredibly high and then it crashed uh, very quickly. Now, these, the BA2 wave is much more, is much broader and slower if in these predicted values. And again, I must say, because probably a lot of these actual recorded cases were recorded after somebody took a home test and was positive. And so when they go and take the PCR, it's not gonna be a you know 20% positivity rate, it's gonna be 100% positivity rate. So some chunk of this, of, of this positivity rate prediction is, is um, exaggerated because the people that got the, the PCR test knew that they were positive already. And so that's going to boost this number up. But we can be pretty sure that the the comparable case numbers to the, the BA1 and before are somewhere between the orange and blue line. So if we compare this region here to the rest of the pandemic, this is anything but pandemic over, right? COVID over. Um, both so, of these- so Doc, you're, yeah, you're, you're, yeah. Basic, you're, ba you're basically saying that this BA1, BA2 waves are much higher than the Delta and the original, as far as case numbers. I'm not talking about yeah. severity and hospitalizations, purely case numbers. There's no reason to believe that, that your orange, uh, your colored lines on the BA2 will be any or much different from the one from BA1 uh, in reality. I mean, the, the number, the case count. Yeah. Because the trends have been the same with the original, with Delta, with, I mean, with Omicron, with BA1, BA2. The, 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 the relevance or the relationship between the, the positivity rate and case counts pretty much have been standard the whole time, except for BA2. Right, exactly. So, I mean, early on the pandemic, so you know, when we first started testing, uh, you know, this formula didn't apply yet. And here with this first, this first, uh, so that, I mean, the very first wave we had in the, in the beginning of the pandemic, it dropped, was this is how high it got, <laughs> which is nothing compared to what, what was to come. And then that's, that's when we had our multiple week stay at home order. Then when that was lifted, we had this big um, summer surge in 2020. And there, this relationship between positivity and tests um, didn't hold. All right. So this formula that I've used, I started after that wave because it took, you know, it took a while for the whole system to stabilize. Uh, and the, the testing, the testing protocols and regimen, and infrastructure to get set up. But after this, um, the spring wave, the the summer wave of 2020, then this relationship held very, very tightly until um, this BA, you know, this March BA2 wave. Yeah, pretty pretty much when the uh, when the the state decided that they weren't going to be offering the free tests and, and, you know, like I said, on Kauai and, and our, our, we have the highest positivity rate, I would bet, and I don't know this, but I would, I would bet that we have a higher testing per capita because we have the availability of testing mm -hmm. around the Island. We have the central, uh, not, I'm not counting medical clinics and hospitals. I'm just talking about the county's testing. We have the convention hall that's still open every day and we still have the mobile van that go, vans, they go around the communities every day. So, so, you know, more testing, higher positivity rate, mm. more cases, more cases re recorded. So, uh, so a lot, I know there's yeah. a lot of questions about BA4, BA5, Doc, but I mean, uh, yeah. I really want you to finish with this. Yeah, okay, slide. let's, we'll, we'll do the numbers in the, uh, the Mill and Charlie broadcasting system here. <laughs> <laughs> okay. So here's the, the Kinza E thermometer reading for, from today. We're still at critical risk. And again, this is thermometers that people have in their homes when they take their temperature. It reports it to Kinza uh, on, a, on a smart, like a smart app. 
And Kenza then collects it and looking at Hawaii, uh, we're still in this critical region here. So we've been as high as, um, you know, what was it? Uh, high as in the 90s, but it's, it's come back from that. But um, by this measurement, you know, we're not at the point where we could say the pandemic is over. <laughs> anyway, uh, in, a, in any state of the imagination. So um, now here's something that I pointed out before, which is the comparison between Hawaii and the rest of the country in the per capita daily case rates. So even if the rest of the country is also changing to home tests uh, more than um, more than the recorded PCR tests, uh, Hawaii is probably very similar to the rest of the country. So we can make this comparison and it's likely not, therefore not affected by the shift in the home tests. And we see here, so uh, orange is Hawaii and the blue is the USA. And we see that for most of the pandemic, Hawaii was, its per capita case rate was much better than the United States. Here um, during that summer peak, it got pretty bad, it got comparable. But then once that was over, Hawaii stayed much lower in its um, per capita case rate. The US jumped much bigger. And, but then when we had the Delta wave here, Hawaii caught up with the rest of the, of the mainland, but then it dropped down again. And, but when the BA1 wave hit, in January, Hawaii jumped above the rest of the country in per capita cases. So this is the first time Hawaii's really been worse than the rest of the country. And then it came back down actually, so it tracked pretty close to what was going on in the, in the rest of the country. But now in the BA2 wave, Hawaii for the first time is many times worse than the mainland in terms of the per capita case rate. And um, you know, so what can explain that? Well, it happens that um, at, uh, at about the point where these two start to split, but not exactly, is when Hawaii ended its mandate, its indoor mask mandate. So that happened at the same time as Hawaii starts to pull away from the rest of the country. So, you know, it makes me wonder um, if Hawaii had not had the mask mandate, you know, would we have been worse than the rest of the country for this whole time? Uh, and I think that really needs to be thought through. So what, you know, what, somebody needs to be accountable and discuss why Hawaii suddenly got worse than the rest of the country. Because that's obviously, it's a public health policy con, uh, consequence. Um, I mean, the an alternative is that we got some horrible variant here that wasn't in the rest of the country. That's certainly not the case. Um, there, there is a lot of diversity um, in the different states tra trajectories, but why is Hawaii, um, why did this change in this period here? And it doesn't seem to be that Hawaii had different variants from the US mainland. Um, and I should point out when, when somebody uh, campaigning for office claims that they were responsible for Hawaii uh, being better than the rest of the country, they had need to be asked, were they also responsible for the recent peak where Hawaii was worse than the rest of the country? Yeah, uh, you know, I, I it, it, you know, I, I just think it's so awkward when, you know, these politicians take credit. Uh, I heard it again last night on a debate how, you know, the lieutenant governor is just taking all the credit for keeping Hawaii uh, at, uh, at the top as far as, uh, you know, the, doing the best in the country. And, and as he speaks, we're not. Um, and, I, and I think you're right. Yeah. I think these and, and you know, you know, I, I really uh, criticize the lieutenant governor because he, he, he takes ownership of it. But it's not just him. It's all of the policymakers. It's all the ledges, no one held anyone accountable and allowed these things to happen. When you look at those major spikes and, and uh, you and Dr. Tim Brown make it a really good and very clear point that whenever we lifted some sort of safety protocol, whether it was masks or uh, whatever it may be, uh, 
know, safe travels or whenever we lifted something, the spikes occurred. I mean, it's, it's very clear there is a direct correlation when we ease up on, on safety measures, we will get a spike in cases. That, that's just, you know, when it happens time and time again, and, you know, you can pretty much assure you, yourself that that's the cause. And that's exactly what happened. We, you know, we lifted the mask mandate. Oh, no social distance. Everybody do what you want. No masks in airplanes, no masks at airports. What do you think is going to happen? We, we knew it was going to happen. See, we changed. We became more lax. The, the United States, the mainland, had lost their, their uh, safety protocols a while ago. And that is why I think, Doc, our, our numbers went to the roof because they stayed the same. They, they, their behaviors weren't changed. Ours did. And when ours changed, we became more unsafe and the numbers spiked. That, that's my assessment. That's my non-professional assessment. Yeah, I mean, it's tricky to infer causes just from the, the consequences when there's so many things that can, uh, can input to cause a change. But, I, you know, I don't, this needs to be explained. You know, why did Hawaii suddenly for the first time get much worse than the rest of the country for a, a large jump, uh, uh, for a large chunk of time here? And um, I'm going to try to, uh, let's see. This may not be um, too visible. Let's see here. This is from Reinhold Penner. Um, uh, this shows the, the whole pandemic, the per capita rates for the entire country and um, what you can see is uh, it may be hard to make out the different states but if you can see that the the peaks have very different courses in um, in the different states so um, let's see here this may be just too small to be useful but okay so look at down here um is that enlarging for you yes it is okay good so look at this ten tennessee it's just slowly growing here it didn't have a ba2 peak it had a ba1 peak but it didn't have a ba2 peak and um same with Oklahoma, uh, pretty much Nevada. New Hampshire had a big BA2 peak. Um, and North Carolina had a smaller one. So there's a lot of differences between the states in terms of what happened with BA2. And um, so this isn't all the states, but, um, and this doesn't have Hawaii in this particular figure. I just grabbed this from uh, what Reinhold Penner is uh, putting out, but it shows there's quite a lot of variability. So what happened is BA2 got to Hawaii quickly and, and grew very quickly. And it didn't get to the other states and do the same thing in the same way. Why? Um, probably, if, you know, uh, air travel. Yeah, I was going to say probably because yeah. these states don't have 40,000 new people coming in every day. Yeah, yeah, that's, that's probably the reason. So we're like, um, you know, we're like a, a central hub, and anything that can grow fast is going to grow here um, soon uh, after it gets out. So, um, anyway, let me leave that. Um, here's the hospitalization. So, one of the one of the rationales behind discontinuing public health protections is that now the hospitalization the severe the rates of severe illness are much lower than they used to be before but if you look at these hospitalizations um you know this is this is the delta peak and uh, th this is the BA1 peak and this is the BA2. So 
they're not the the peaks are not not getting as high, but these are the, these are not absent, <laughs> and we are not at the present moment. We are not at the bottom of a trough. We are still at a at a pretty flat peak of hospitalizations. So you know when you combine all of these things together, we are still at a very high level of the pandemic of cases and severe illness. Uh, compared to the rest of the pandemic in the past, we are not at a trough. And despite the fact that the mm -hmm. these cases have been coming down um, for uh, a number of weeks, it looks like about what would you say six weeks they're claiming? Mel, for um, for what was that? You said the. They're claiming that things are great now because oh yeah six six coming yeah, six declining cases for six straight weeks yeah so that these these uh, intervals are two months so that's about one and a half months so but look how high they are they're still uh, yeah. in in the major part of the delta wave and that's with our our very low testing rate and compared if this was if this positivity formula was giving us the actual case rate we'd be we're still above the peak of the delta wave, right? Take this with a grain of salt, but at least qualitatively, it shows this: we are not in a good place at the moment. We're still at very high levels of COVID in the community. So um, now let's look at what's going on with BA4 and BA5. So this is the Walgreens variant tracking, and it's based on the PCR test, which again, it, the PCR has three little snippets of the D, of the RNA sequence of the virus, and basically, if you take this, the, you take the sample from the patient, and you process it into, you reverse transcribe it into DNA, and then if the if the DNA sticks to their little snippets of viral DNA, then um, the machine lights up that you know it's positive. And they use three different snippets. And it happens that the BA4 and 5 has mutated so that one of those snippets no longer sticks to their to the um, uh, the, the virus. And so you have what's called the S gene dropout. So that's the spike protein. And so their little snippet of the spike protein is so mutated in BA4 and 5 that it no longer sticks to their um, to their little snippet. And so you have what's called S gene dropout or um, uh, S gene target failure. And that's how they can tell that it's BA4 or 5. And so the black and the, and the yellow, that's um, BA4 and 5. Now, actually, I'm wondering, I don't know how, right? I don't know how they're distinguishing 4 from 5 here because S gene target failure happens to both of them. So I, I need to figure that out. I'm sorry, I don't know that. But you can see that five is really taking off and is now just reached the majority in the country based on the people that go tested at Walgreens. And uh, the BA1, that's this red line. This is sort of the percentage of all the tests that they get. So that had its big day in the sun um, in January. And then it started crashing and but then the BA2, which uh, was um, had immune evasion from, so this BA1 wave, it, it infects a huge number of people and gives them immunity to BA1. All right, but BA2 is different enough from BA1 that it basically has a disguise and the immune system doesn't recognize it. And so it's able to infect people and have a high growth rate. So the, all the immunity people have against the BA1 means that the BA1 infected person is infecting less than one other person, all right? And that's why these numbers keep dropping. But the BA2 infected person um, comes across one of those, those people with recent immunity from BA1 and it, and it can infect them. And so it takes off. So that's, that's what the difference is in immunity, which is producing the, the different, the growth advantage of BA2 so it infects a huge chunk of the population. And now um, it starts running out of people that are, that are not immune to BA2. And so its reproduction number drops below one and it starts crashing. 
But then along comes BA4 and BA5, um, which appear to have come out of South Africa. BA2, as I, BA2, 12 one, as I mentioned, came out of the US East Coast. Um, but now BA4 and BA5 are advancing. BA5 is the growth champion here. What, you know, what's really interesting is that BA4 tags along, all right? It's not being, it's not being dominated by BA5. I mean, it's not being driven below, uh, below one in its reproduction by BA5. It's still uh, hanging in there even though BA5 is the is the biggest growth um, uh, of, of any of the of these variants that we have common now. And so now it looks like about 50-50 chance if you get COVID that it's BA5. And um, so I don't know if that, uh, what other questions were there about BA4 and 5? Well, I think, uh, you know, just general questions. I mean, from what I'm reading and what I'm hearing, and we we're just talking about four and five right now, right? And and I just heard today that they're saying it's it's sixty percent of uh, of the nation's cases, and that'll you know as you show in your graphs, it 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 exponentially grows. So you know, obviously, it'll be the the, the major strain very shortly. But we've heard it's more contagious. We've heard that it's uh, it's reinf reinfection properties on people that have already had COVID is is higher uh, there's just so many things that we're learning about ba4 and ba5 and then there's still ba2.75 and and B, uh, B, ba5.2.1 that i'm reading that is slowly making its way across but what are you seeing what do you believe is going to happen with you know, let's keep the other new ones aside just ba4 ba5 if we're looking at this this chart this uh, walgreens chart uh, is there any reason to believe that it's going to act any differently than BA1 and BA2 did? Or should we expect the same type of increase up to the to the 100%? Um, I, th I think it's going to go up to the 100% line. It'll be interesting to see how, how long BA4 can tag along. Um, you know, in terms of prognostication, uh, here's where this week, these week-to-week -week ratios, I think, are helpful. So this is where I, I look at the case numbers in this by each by each county and I divide them by the case numbers the week before. And when we do, so that takes care of the fact that so, a lot of people get tested on some days of the week and not other day, days of the week. And so each of these lines is a different county um, and Honolulu is the orange one here and uh, Big Island, Hawaii is the blue one. And so here's our BA1 wave, all right? So when, when the line is at one, that's basically saying it's flat. Last week's numbers are the same as this week's numbers. So this is, and it's flat. But then it jumps up and my gosh, in, in Honolulu, there was a time where one week was four times as many cases as the previous week. And that's just mind boggling growth. That means a half, that's like three and a half day doubling time. So at the very beginning of the pandemic, that's what the, the doubling time was. And so that's that's a huge growth advantage. But then what happens? It, it, it infects so many people that uh, the, the recovering people are immune and it starts to run out of people to infect. And so uh, in this period, its growth rate slows. And finally, the week to week ratio was one. So that means it's flat again. So this is a peak. And then here it drops down. So this is when the peak is falling and crashing. So we notice that the week, the rates that it dropped, the fastest that it was ever dropping was not as big a change as how fast it was growing during the peak growth peak. So it's a slower process here. And then, so this, this whole period, it's the case numbers are coming down from here to here. And when it goes back to zero again, it's flat. And then we start to see the BA2 wave here. And so this was the, the peak growth um, rate of the BA2 wave. And then here is where it reached its peak. And then here's the six weeks while it's submerged under this blue line. This is the, the time of 
the case numbers going down. And this is our six weeks here where it's dropped below this one line. But it's remarkable to me, and I, I you know, it's it's hard because it's it's hard to analyze it with just this, just these numbers. But I think um, what's significant is that when the BA1 wave dropped below one, it, it went down very quickly and it got a substantially lower here. This BA2 wave is very, very close to the surface. All right. So that means the numbers are not dropping very fast. So this means it's a broad peak. And this is very worrisome at the end because it looks like it's starting to go back up again. All right, when if this goes above the line, that means we're starting to grow again. And we haven't really hit much of a trough because there's not a, not a lot of, of curve here under this uh, line of one. And this to me, uh, I would say this is likely um, the appearance of BA5 starting to rear its ugly head because uh, this, you know, th this, these, this drop in this wave is nothing comparable to the drop we got from the BA1 wave. It's been very flat. And I think that's because basically BA5 is starting to uh, emerge from small numbers into larger numbers. And, and I think uh, within the next week or two, we're gonna see the case numbers start to go up again. Um, you know, this is pretty flat, so it, it might continue in this flat area for another few weeks, but I, it, show, it shows a pattern of starting to reverse. And I think that would be the BA5 wave and, and BA4 because it's, it's part of the mix. Um, well, I think when we had you and Dr. Tim Brown on the show about three weeks ago, um, that's kind of what your predictions were. Um, and maybe it was Tim Brown mentioning that the BA4, BA5 surge, would we would see it, I think he said, uh, four to six weeks or some, something like that. I can't really remember. But that's playing out. And, and if you look at your, and you go back to your Walgreen slide, that's quite interesting how Walgreens, <laughs> yeah. uh, and, and granted that's, a, that's Walgreens, but it is, you know, it, it is a great data, but it, it pretty much is matching what BA1, BA2 did and uh, we're we're right about that point where we're going to start seeing an increase in BA BA five, and uh, I I guess I agree with you that we're starting to see. It, it's kind of troubling that it didn't go below the one line and it just stayed flat, and now we'll start seeing the uptake, and you'll see the BA five cases now, um, and we right back into another surge, like you said, in a couple of weeks possibly. Yeah. Now. How big this is going to be, how fast it's going to be, I, I have no idea. Um, you know, it's been different in different countries. So what BA5 has done in South Africa was much uh, more timid than what it did in Portugal. So what it's going to do here, um, it's hard to say. One thing I should mention about these variant trackers, so these are always from 0 to 100%. So they're just telling you what fraction of the tests are a different variant, but it doesn't say how many cases there are. So, you know, it would be possible that uh, if the overall cases were dropping, that even as something rose in percent, it could actually be declining in actual numbers. So you can't use these graphs to tell you how severe the wave is, but um, I mean, it's, it's notable that the shape you know, the shape of these of these waves is very similar and the, the interval, the width of them. And that tells you uh, that the advances in these variants in gaining growth advantage, um, there's a certain regularity to it. And, um, you know, we'll have to see what how this plays out, how BA5 plays out going forward. But there's, you know, so a lot of people well, you know, when they talk about personal responsibility and, you know, weighing your risk in terms of uh, how to deal with this public, with this pandemic, it belies the fact that a lot of the, what we see going on is a collective phenomenon. It's an emergent phenomenon out of many, you know, millions of different events, 
all right? So there's millions of different people, uh, events of people contacting each other, being in each other's vicinity. And then there's, you know, billions of viral particles being produced. And these massive numbers um, add up to a collective phenomenon like, uh, like thermodynamics. And it's beyond just an individual, um, an individual event. And so you see, start to see regularities in these large numbers and these large patterns that go beyond any individual's experience. And, uh, you know, when you're in a traffic jam, uh, no amount of person personal responsibility is going to help you in a, get out of a traffic jam when you're in a traffic jam. That's a collective phenomenon. And I think it's important that people sort of open their eyes to how much of, of modern life is a collective phenomenon. And so, well, the latest, the latest inflation numbers, all right, this is happening around the world. You know, why? Why is suddenly around the world inflation happening? Well, this is another collective phenomenon. So uh, when an individual company raises the price on some good, that's an individual event, but it's in a context of something that's much bigger than the individual. And, uh, and it's, you know, trying to say what, what's causing it. Of course, the, uh, you know, some people say, well, Biden is causing it. Other, others will say, well, the, uh, all the COVID relief funds are causing it. Well, I don't know. There's a lot of, a lot of contr contributors, but here, here it is, here it is happening. And now, you know, we need to use the tools of a national economic policy to try to reduce it. But the pandemic is just another example, uh, of something like inflation, where it's beyond just an individual event. It's a collective phenomenon. Yeah, well, I, I, I guess my my concern as we, we look at the ability of this virus to mutate to a point where it can basically take over the prior variant. And, and uh, what I'm hearing is that this BA4, BA5 does that quite well. And it's in fact more contagious. Uh, there's still jury's still out as far as severity of illness, from what I understand. But the one thing that we know is the contagiousness is much higher than yeah BA two, which which just it's it's like a perfect storm, you know. Yeah, I mean it's it's very contagious, and and just uh, you know anecd anecdotal reports, people are saying a lot of people I've known that haven't gotten COVID through the entire pandemic have now gotten it. And that would, I've seen more and more, you know, on Twitter, people reporting that. So that's not a very uh, scientifically sound uh, way of quantifying it. But as anecdotes, uh, when you start seeing it repeatedly, uh, you start to wonder. And, and, and that goes for me, people I know personally that have avoided getting COVID the whole pandemic now have gotten it. You know, Doc, on Monday night, we had Dr. Uh, I believe his name was Todd Allen, Chief Quality uh, Officer at, at the Queen's Health Systems. He was on Spotlight, I'm sorry. We, we replayed his Spotlight uh, interview, which I thought was great. And he talked about the hospitals are struggling, you know, statewide. He talked about the BA4, BA5. He talked about the, the importance of masking indoors, that we should all be masking indoors. We should all be practicing these these things even though it's not mandatory yesterday uh the department of education department of health came out and lifted the indoor mask mandates for public schools and i i honestly i figured that was going to happen but what what bothered me or baffled me was their quarantine I, i'm not sure if you oh. saw the press conference yeah i watched it okay good um maybe maybe you can share with us a little bit about your <laughs> thoughts uh, i i mean I thought of you and Dr. Brown when, as soon as, uh, when, as soon as I heard it come out of their mouths, I had to go watch it two more times to make sure I heard the, <laughs> what I heard. Um, but, but if you could just share with us your thoughts, is I don't think that's a great idea. I'm not a doctor, but uh, it it made no sense. It was no logic uh, for if you get your exposure outside of school, you got to stay home. If you get your exposure in in the school, then you get to come back to school. What what are what are yeah. your thoughts? 
All right, well, that uh, brings us to the subject of my last slide. Oh, okay. Um, so this was a, a book written in uh, 1852 <clears throat> by Charles McKay called Extraordinary Popular Delusions and the Madness of Crowds. All right. And so he, he documents all these different cases where uh, basically a, a delusion swept through the entire population and people acted on the delusion. And uh, he, call, he mentions the, the burning of witches, uh, the tulip, the tulip bubble, um, a, a numbers of instances where the whole, this whole population got this idea that was, not, that was detached from reality. And, and I think um, this is what's going on with this current, uh, the, the urgency of normal or the, this, li you know, we're going to learn to live with COVID um, because it's here now. And that translates to pretending it's not here. And so this, here's my own analysis, what I, what I call the logic of normal. And that we can understand these, these policy changes that make, don't seem to make any sense from a biological or public health point of view. So the first premise is that, that no permanent change to how we live our lives, the day-to-day -day lives uh, uh, from how we lived it in 2019, no permanent change is acceptable, okay? And, you know, temporary changes, yes, but permanent changes, no. So any, any kind of, uh, all of these public health measures, quarantine, um, isolation, uh, wearing of masks, capacity limits, um, all of these things are not acceptable as a permanent change. All right, that's premise number one. Premise number two is that basically uh, this is as good as it gets. All right, so COVID is here to stay. We've got the vaccines and there's nothing more that we can really do to get rid of this virus. And so uh, this is it. And this is how it's gonna be from now on. And therefore, since by premise number one, we can't accept any permanent change. And number two, this is as good as it gets. That means we have to stop all of our, all of the extraordinary things that we did uh, during the pandemic and go back to living as we did in 2019. And we just have to accept that COVID is here and people will get sick, but uh, you know, it'll be like the flu uh, where indeed a certain number of people die from the flu every year, but we've accepted it. And so we're gonna just accept that a certain number are gonna die from COVID every year. And that's just how it is. So that's, if you examine the, you know, the dropping, the, the dropping of um, all of these public health precautions and, and protections, I think it fits, it's motivated by that kind of logic. And then the people, so the people that, um, who have the power to impose restrictions, they're, they're faced with that, that they think people are gonna say, well, are we gonna do this forever? Because this is it, this is as good as it gets, nothing's gonna change in the future. So if you, if you think we should mask now, that means we're gonna be masking forever. So what are the fallacies? I, I mean, does that seem like a reasonable logic of normal <laughs> behind? Yeah, behind I, I think, I think, um, I, I think, yeah, you helped me a little bit. Um, yeah, I just, I just saw it as, as just being purely political. The political pressure got the best of them. And, but, but yeah, your, you, you, your assessment is, is the most logical that I've heard so far. Well, so, I mean, why is there the political pressure? And I, and I, and the reason I, you know, what I see people reporting is they say, all right, basically, you know, this is it. We have to live with COVID. And so now, we just have to return to our lives as that we were before because nothing else, no permanent change is acceptable. And, and they don't see anything on the horizon coming that would make it far better than the current situation in terms of the number of cases. So there, you know, I think, 
it's that I think is a, is the is the biggest fallacy that needs to be addressed. All right. So what in other words, what is there to hold out for? What is what is there um, that uh, will make it better so that it's worth the the short term um, inconveniences of doing things that we didn't do in 2019 so that we don't get COVID now and uh, and and we're and we're protected until we get to a better day. Well, I think the, the biggest thing is vaccines. All right, so people have accepted that they have to uh, uh, they can get vaccinated. So it's a little bit you know it's one day a year uh, uh, that they do something inconvenient, which is to get like the annual flu vaccine. That's widely accepted. And so I think if it got to the point where people would have to take an annual COVID vaccine, I think that would be people would find that consistent with premise number one, which is nothing, no permanent change is acceptable. So, but we're not there because COVID keeps evolving so fast that the, what was a really amazing vaccine on the Wuhan, the original Wuhan variant, uh, when the vaccines first came out, um, and they not only prevented severe disease and death, but infection. Well, that, that last property is just about gone now. So you can be four times vaccinated, you get exposed to BA5 and you're gonna get COVID. It's not gonna protect you. So, but it is still, they're still showing good protectiveness against severe disease. And similarly, prior infection also seems to show uh, prior, uh, good protection against severe disease in that, that level of immunity. But um, it's really important. That's another, another thing to keep in mind is that when people talk about reduced levels of hospitalization and, and death and severe disease, that's only the acute phase of COVID. But there's this prolonged aftermath uh, and they're still trying to figure out the causes of it, but long COVID, all right? And it's, there's a lot of divergent estimations of how frequent long COVID is. Some physiological effects, uh, the, the frequency is like 50%. So um, they've done tests that the clotting, your clotting uh, mechanisms in your blood are out of whack for months after getting a mild case of COVID. Uh, another recent paper showed that the brain shows signs of inflammation uh, with high frequency in, in people that had mild uh, cases of COVID. And this is not even necessarily connected to brain fog. This is like under the, under the radar levels of things that are, that are going, that are off in your body. And the frequency of, of, the, uh, of these, you know, asymptomatic derangements of your physiology is very high with COVID. And, you know, keep in mind, COVID gets in through the nose and the lungs, but that's just the, the starting point. You know, once it starts replicating there, it gets into the bloodstream and then it goes throughout the body and it can, uh, uh, different people get it, their organs attacked in, at different rates. So um, then there's now a suspicion that in some people, the, the, they get a long, they get a persistent infection of COVID, right? The COVID finds its, the virus finds its, way into different tissues that for some reason the immune system can't get it, get rid of it in and so they're actually they have these little you know it's like a cokey frogs in uh, maliko gulch um on maui those things are just there croaking away they haven't spread to the rest of the island but they just keep getting there um and uh they haven't they just haven't been able to exterminate them so in the same way the immune system just can't get rid of COVID from certain parts of the body. And they, they think that maybe the digestive tract is one of them. Uh, so this is all science that's, you know, rapidly uh, developing uh, without any definitive answers yet. But um, there's other signs they, they, with people with long COVID, they look at their blood and, you know, months after they have their infection, there's the spike protein you know, circulating around. And, you know, so what is producing that spike protein for months? Because, uh, you know, proteins get, they're, they're digested, there's a, high, a rapid turnover in the body. So if you keep finding a, a steady level of protein months months later, something has to keep producing it. 
So there's, you know, there's this possibility that COVID is setting up shop somewhere in your body and that your immune system gets rid of most of it from your body, but it's still there and cranking out these, you know, very irritating proteins that your immune system is getting revved up about and uh, putting it in, in a sort of st a constant state of, uh, you know, a guerrilla warfare. And this can damage the long-term health. So these are, these are possibilities that are still uh, trying to, they're trying to figure out what's going on with this disease, but it's not just a cold where your body gets rid of it once and for all. And you, once your, your main respiratory symptoms are gone, it's a very a completely different virus. It's a very, very weird virus. And, you know, I mean, lots of viruses, they are, they are geniuses at taking up permanent residence in your body. So, um, you know, the, the virus that causes mononucleosis, Epstein-Barr virus, that gets into uh, immune system cells and it stays in them alive for your whole life. Uh, and similarly, you know, herpes viruses, they, they start in the skin, but then they get into the nerves and they travel up to the base of the nerves and they take up permanent residence in the nerves. And that's what uh, chickenpox does. And so the chickenpox virus uh, it gets in the nerves and it stays there for decades and the immune system it keeps it down. But then, you know, if the immune system gets weakened for some various reasons and when people get older, it gets weakened, the virus is, all right, guys, we've got a plan. We're going to get out of here. And, the, and this is what shingles is. So the virus is in the base of the nerve and it starts replicating and comes down the nerve and it says, all right, we're going to escape. <laughs> this is the great escape. And it gets to the end of the nerve and then starts replicating in the, stin in the skin cells and makes a rash and a blister. And it's going to hope that little blister popped open is going to infect the next person. It's going to make an escape. So this is the you know, long evolved, brilliant strategy of uh, the chickenpox virus to, you know, when, when it thinks, well, maybe this host isn't going to last that long. Let's, let's go, boys. Let's try to get into somebody else. So, so viruses, uh, have ev many of them have evolved uh, genius strategies of, of staying in your body for decades. And, uh, and so shingles is one of the big downsides of that persistent viral infection. And fortunately, there's a vaccine that pumps the immune system up again against that virus and prevents the shingles from happening. But, uh, you know, so the question is, you know, what did, what did SARS-CoV-2 do before it got into humans? And if it evolved in bats, well, it turns out that a lot of these coronaviruses in bats are persistent infections. So that the, 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 the SARS-CoV-2 has, uh, has had thousands of years of evolution to figure out how to have a persistent infection in a bat. And some of that knowledge might be allowing it to have persistent infections in us. So this is, this is all science that needs to be figured out, but, uh, but these are things that are emerging. You, you know, th that, that's the scary thing, right? I mean, it seems like a very intelligent virus, right? It, it, it's able to uh, change itself so, so quickly uh, and just to overrun the, the prior variant. I mean, it's kind of scary. You talk about the long, long COVID, you know, it'll, it's going to take years before we can figure out what the real effects of this virus is. Uh, the doctor that was on our show on Monday night or, or on Spotlight mentioned that, you know, these long COVID symptoms are showing up even in pediatric cases, even in, in patients that had a, an asymptomatic infection. So and we don't know yet. It's just too soon to tell. BA4, BA5, I saw one of the questions um, are we seeing if BA4, BA5 are, are starting to impact the lungs like the Delta and the original strain, or is it still mainly upper respiratory? I, I know the doctor on Monday said it was still, from what I heard anyway, it was still mainly upper respiratory, um, but but I don't know if, it, if it's evolved to the point where it's, it's attacking the lungs. Yeah, so there's some preliminary studies, and I think it was hamsters that showed it attacked the lungs more than the BA1. Uh, what it's going to do in humans, I think it's still 
they're still under research. Um, so the, the, the jury's out. Um, but in terms of other long COVID, so the problem is that the vaccinations, while they are preventing severe illness and death, they don't seem to be cutting down on long COVID very much. All right, so that was a study um, out of Veterans Administration data where they have you know, millions of people in that system. And they found the vaccine seemed to reduce the long COVID incidents only by 15% um, overall. So, I mean, that's, you know, you know if, if that wasn't long COVID, um, I wouldn't be nearly as worried about, uh, about getting infected with coronavirus. But it's the fact that we don't know everything that's going on with this virus and it, and it affects the brain, which is a very delicate organ and has less repair capacity than a lot of the other organs in the body. And, you know, anything that can get near the brain, uh, because, you know, the brain is, uh, has quite a number of long-term degenerative diseases that are common, you know, Alzheimer's, I know something like 30% of people over 80 uh, or uh, something along those lines get it. Um, so uh, it's not a rare disease by any means. Um, and that, you know, that makes me be very cautious about uh, having hubris that, oh, it's just a cold or, oh, it's just a flu. And anybody who compares it to a flu is, is ignoring all of the science that says it's, it behaves extremely differently. Um, so it's, it's a precautionary stance. Uh, it's saying we, there's a lot of unknowns and uh, because there are so many diseases that take a long time to occur and especially neurodegenerative ones. So there's, there's long polio, all right? It's called post-polio syndrome. And it takes like, uh, like 25 years to show up. So this is somebody that got over polio 25 years before and they seemed fine. And now they're facing difficulties with their neurons in their limbs and uh you know that that kind of phenomenon makes me want to be very cautious about any kind of safety clearance i would give to uh to COVID. yeah unfortunately you know i think majority of the population have uh have personal knowledge of people that got COVID that didn't suffer very bad symptoms um, a smaller number of people have a personal connection to people that have had severe complications with COVID or even lost their lives to COVID. And I think those people are much more uh, in tune to, to listen to the science, but it's, it's becoming more and more, uh, I think more and more people are becoming so uh, lackadaisical mm. to, towards COVID now. It seems like every day this goes on, when things happen like yesterday, when, when the DOE comes out and, and, you know, basically says it's, you know, the, the, the new landscape that uh, minimizing what's really happening and the, and the potential threat to our kids in school, it, you just add more people to that list that are, are having the feeling that we're, we're, we're out of the, the fire already and now we can start to live normally. And, and I'm surprised that they did that knowing that we are on the edge of uh, of another surge that we that we know is going to be happening in the next couple of weeks and possibly a couple of surges following that uh, in the BA 2.75 and that's already making its way across. So I, I think the more and more we fail to educate the public of the reality of COVID, the more and more comfortable they, they get with ignoring that it's here. And that's, I think, a scary thing. Well, I think that's where that, that logic of normal comes in. All right. So people say, well, look, the, the BA5 wave and the BA275 wave, this is just how it is now. So we're just going to get wave after wave. And, um, and it's not acceptable that we change our day-to-day change our -day lives in any way from how it was in 2019. So it's not acceptable that our kids have to wear masks in school for the duration forever from here on out. So we're just going to have to, so we, we just have to uh, accept that 
there's going to be wave after wave, and that's not a reason to put our masks on because uh, that would mean we'd have to wear masks forever. And so that's, I think, the logic behind why they were eliminated, right? So I, I don't think that's a valid logic because um, I do think, uh, uh, in, you know, the, in, the, in the near future, we're going to see better treatments and better vaccinations that can really stop COVID transmission from happening. So just today, uh, a new vaccine was approved for the United States, the Novavax vaccine. So if you know anybody who has resisted uh, getting vaccinated because they don't like this mRNA, that these mRNA vaccines, that, so the, the anti-vaxxers call it a uh, gene therapy and say it's not a vaccine, it's gene therapy. Well, if, if you know somebody where that's not just an, an anti-vax excuse, but they really believe that and they're really worried about what this mRNA is gonna do, um, the Novavax vaccine is all protein and it's, it combines protein, uh, uh, the, uh, the spike protein, plus uh, a, a, a part of a plant uh, from the saponin plant that really, really riles up the immune system. That's called the adjuvant. And so it combine, it makes little nanoparticles with the spike protein and this plant compound that irritates the immune system. And that seems to be a very effective combination. That's the what the Shingrix vaccine is. All right, that's the the anti anti shingles um, vaccine that's been uh, introduced since uh, just about the past five years and been very effective, much more effective than the previous uh, live attenuated vaccine in stopping shingles. So uh, should be very shortly um, that so the United States has bought something like uh, two million doses. And the, the Novavax vaccine should be available for anybody who is held off because they didn't like any of these uh, uh, genetic sequence vaccines. So uh, please, if you know of anybody or you're one of them, please look into getting the Novavax vaccine. Um, and then in the, in the uh, some months from now, we're going to get uh, new uh, nucleotide vaccines, mRNA vaccines, based on the, on the Omicron variant sequence. So those should be more effective in preventing infections as well as severe disease, we hope. And then any number of antiviral compounds, you know, the, many companies are racing to come up with the next uh, successor to Paxlovid. And, you know, I think these have the potential to change the situation uh, radically in the future. Um, the problem is when people are letting it rip and letting transmission uh, just happen in, 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 on the order of billions of people, that's how these variants evolve. And that's why they're evolving so fast and why we have this treadmill of one after another. So, you know, there's no indication that, that uh, SARS-CoV-2 has run out of evolutionary innovations. Uh, and so it's very easy so it's very easy to evolve immune escape, all right, to, to basically to disguise yourself from the antibodies that somebody already has. You just have to change. You know, it's just like putting on a costume and, and, and you just change your shape because the, the antibody protein is just this um, you know, sequence of amino acids that fold into a particular shape that latches like lock and key onto parts of the, of the viral proteins. So all the, the virus has to do is just change its shape a little bit, and then that lock and key doesn't fit anymore. But the challenge is you have to change your shape and still do what you were doing in, in reproducing the virus. So you have to maintain your function in, with this new disguise. So, um, you know, when you put on a Halloween costume, uh, you know, basically you just go trick or treating. But if you, if you try to uh, do your day job in a Halloween costume, it can be challenging. And so that's, that's the evolutionary challenge for the virus is it's got to put on this Halloween costume and still keep the replication rate going, keep the infection getting into the cells, keeping all those functions still working. And so um, that, you know, that's a challenge for viruses, but COVID doesn't seem to have any problem in, in doing those simultaneously, both, you know, putting on a disguise and being just as good or even better at infecting people. And if, when, you know, when, when COVID is going to run out of those tricks, we don't know. And that's why we keep getting this steady um, 
parade of new variants. That's the that's the scary thing. This virus, it, it's it, and we're you know all the these variants that we're seeing right now are uh, variants of the Omicron. Uh, we, I mean, you know, there's still there's still a the chance that we could have an entirely new strain, uh, whatever the next letter they're gonna pick. I think they skip P, whatever it is. It, 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 I mean, we we've been seeing we've seen this virus mutate relatively quickly and easily just off of the Omicron, but it's the changes are so drastic that it's been able to escape the immunity. And, and I, I mean, if we don't get a handle on infection, right? If we, we as a country don't get a handle on infection, we will provide the food for these variants to continue to mutate and continue to escape immunity but there's a chance that any so any potential change or mutation could impact the severity of the illness, and then we all gonna be in a bunch of deep kimchi. Th that is what I'm I'm afraid of. Well, so the thing is, you know, there's this myth that the viruses evolve to get weaker. So um, COVID is already really weak uh, compared to what a virus could be doing. Okay, so. What, w what would make the virus evolve to get weaker and to, in other words, to cause less severe disease um, than it did before? Well, that that would only happen if the severe disease was was blocking it getting transmitted. But with COVID, you know, people have have uh, a lot of people have no symptoms and they've already infected all, uh, all their friends and co-workers. All right. So so there's no there's no value to the virus in changing uh, it, when it's already asymptomatic at that rate. The second thing is when, you know, when do people get severely ill with COVID? So they're, they're no longer in a position where they can go out to meet people and infect them. Well, it's, it's like, uh, you, know, you know, in the, the second week or later, and it's uh, after most of the transmission has already occurred. So the COVID is basically said, see ya, and it's off to its next victim uh, before the person is even severely ill. And, it, and so the, the severity of the illness is not impeding COVID's transmission right now at all. Mm -hmm. And so making it even less severe is not gonna give it much of an advantage. So the, 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 the real danger, which we haven't had, for, we're really fortunate, there hasn't been a variant of high consequence, all right? Where, where COVID discovers uh, a way to evade the immune system and a way to get transmitted where it causes really severe disease. And uh, so, I mean, it, you know, you see like a 50% advantage, all right, 50% advantage between one variant and the previous variant in terms of transmission. All right, so the variant could, you know, the, the more, mortality right now is what uh it's less than half a percent i think the infection mortality rate or infection fatality rate so it could go from a, a half percent fatality rate to say 10 percent fatality rate if it simultaneously had a 50 percent basic increase in transmission that would give it still 40 percent transmission advantage even though it was the, the fatality rate um, was say lowering its transmission, uh, it wouldn't be enough to stop the evolution of, of such a variant. So the only thing that's prevented that is just, it hasn't come along. There, ha the, there haven't been any mutational pathways to such a variant, but there's not much natural selection against increased severity. So we're just really lucky that we haven't seen anything dramatically more severe. You know, SARS-1, what was the I think the fatality rate was like 10% uh, SARS and the MERS, the, the, another coronavirus is like 20%. So the, this, this kind of virus has the potential um, to be much, much more deadly. Uh, but we are very blessed that COVID hasn't discovered that um, so far. Uh, but there's nothing in terms of natural selection that's preventing something that could be much more severe um, than the current variant. 
So just just count count our lucky stars in that regard. Yeah. Well, I mean, it it just uh, the ability again to reinfect with this new variants. It, they, they'll never run out of uh, supply. They, they, they'll never run out of uh, you know. Uh, I know you talked about in other pandemics where you know people got really ill and they died. They weren't able to go out into the communities and spread it asymptomatically. Uh, you know, it's dangerous because there's so many people out there right now that are, are spreading the virus, they're not knowing it because they, they don't have the symptoms. So, uh, yeah, it's just scary. This thing could be could could hang be hanging around for a long, long, long time. I mean, it, it might run out of it might run out of new tricks, but we haven't seen it. It doesn't show any sign of doing that yet. Yeah. I think that's that's the key. We're still in the middle of a pandemic, regardless of what politicians say. And we got to treat it as such. And uh, I, I know we went we went way over time, but oh, Doc, wow. you always you always so. <laughs> um, I mean, you know, the villagers. I, I I gauge by the by the the engagement and the comments and the numbers that uh, you know, and, and you you keep everybody engaged in commenting. And there's a lot of questions. I apologize. I saw one comment that I'm not asking questions. Well, I have a hard time when I'm by myself to scan mm -hmm. all the comments. So I apologize. I, I try to catch what I can, but I don't want to interrupt the doc when he's sharing some vital information. Uh, I, I am here to learn as well. Uh, and so pardon my, uh, my ignorance. I, I, I want to, I want to learn from, from these guys when we have the opportunity. Um, doc, I, I guess I, I just, of course, I'm going to ask you to, your final comments, but I did want you to touch on for our parents that are out here, school teachers that are on, I mean, I see a lot of the comments about the school thing and everybody's all getting frustrated, but it, can you tell us what you would recommend? If you were recommending uh, to a, a, a parent or a, or a school teacher, mm -hmm. what, what would be your recommendation? All right, so this, what's the alternative to the logic of normal that we're operating under now? So I would simply uh, say one alternative is a cost benefit analysis. All right. What is the cost of the mask mandate in, in the school children and what is the benefit? So this is something that was never touched on in, in the press conference uh, from DOH yesterday with Dr. Campbell. Uh, they never, she never talked about what's the benefit of getting rid of the mask mandate. She all she said was, we are shifting from an emergency situation to living with COVID, or that's the logic of normal that I talked about. But if you do it from the logic of cost benefit analysis, all right, what benefit are we getting out of dropping the mask mandate for kids? Um, I don't, I can't imagine very much. And what's the cost? There's going to be a heck of a lot more transmission and that kids are going to infect family members and some of them are going to get very sick and there's going to there's going to be people that die from this change in the mask policy who knows how many you know just you know one person so if you knew who that person was all right and and you said to the to the schools all right we know that this person you know antigena is going to die from this policy of getting rid of the mask mandate but we have to go back to normal and I'm, I'm sorry for Auntie Jenna. I'm, I'm very sorry. All right. That's, you know, we don't know who, who, which uncle or auntie is, is going to die from the increased transmission that removing the masks is going to cause. We don't know how many, but we know uh, we can be confident that getting rid of the masks is going to increase transmission and increase the chance that somebody dies. So what do we get out of that? What's our benefit that's counteracting that cost? I don't see any benefit. All I can see is, is the logic of normal. Well, we can't do this forever. And so this is as good as it gets. So we have to go back to normal. It's not a cost benefit analysis. So I, you know, I would ask about any intervention. Okay. What's the cost and what's the benefit? So clearly a stay at home order. That's the, the most costly of, of any of our interventions, all right? So that's only for extraordinary circumstances when you don't have anything better, when you don't have anything that has a smaller cost and an equal benefit. Uh, and so that would, you know, if you put, if you line things up in order, you, you look at what their benefits are and then look at what their costs are, 
you want to pick all the things that have very little cost and big benefits. And so wearing a, a an N95 or KF94 respirator has very little cost, but it's it's darn good. It's it's more much more effective than the vaccine now in in stopping infection. All right, the vaccines are um, good at preventing severe illness, but not at stopping infection and not at stopping long COVID. And the so the the cost benefit analysis says people should keep masking and they should mask competently and effectively with the most effective um, uh, N95 respirators. All right, because they don't, you know, they cost one under a dollar each. All right, and if that can save you getting sick and having months of health problems, uh, even if it's just a small fraction of the population, it's, the benefit still outweighs the cost by many times. So that's, you know, that's how me as a scientist and, and you know, an, an optimizer, a mathematician, trying to maximize public utility would, would make the decision. I wouldn't do it based on the, on the logic of normal. I would do it on an individual cost benefit analysis for each intervention. So we are no, we are, the, the case numbers are so high and the BA5 is coming on strong and the hospital, hospital, um, rates of uh, people with COVID are still near a peak, are, they're still at the current peak and they are not at a trough by any means. So we don't have any indicators that we are at a minimum stage of the pandemic right now. Um, and so there would, there's no rationale for discontinuing uh, public health protections that we've been doing for months um, or years uh, based on the current numbers in the pandemic. Um, so based on that kind of rationality, uh, getting rid of the mask mandate in the schools makes no sense. And as people are gonna suffer from it beyond the, what suffering there is that the kids have to have for wearing these masks. Um, and uh, that, you know, that's the, my alternative point of view, which is, um, cost benefit, a rational cost benefit analysis and not worrying about normal and not being dominated by this idea that we have to go back to 2019 way of living things um, because uh, otherwise, because this is as good as it gets. So does that make any sense? Absolutely. Yeah. You know, I think uh, you're preaching to the choir, unfortunately. I wish, I, I really wish uh, they would allow you uh, a half an hour on spotlight um i really wish you know you you had an opportunity to share your your expertise you know again math doesn't have a political agenda you know uh science doesn't have a political agenda what what we all saw tonight with the numbers the charts those are those are uh that, that's science that's that's mathematics that's not um it, it is what it is that's just uh, and and we can all relate to that. Even though we're not scientists or experts, we can understand the way you deliver the message. So we appreciate that. Uh, again, it's I wish more people would have an opportunity to see this. Hmm. But but your your uh, logic of normal, I think, is what concerns me the most because after August first, there will be no safety measures in place. There there will be none. We will have returned to normal at a time where all the medical experts are warning everyone about BA5. Uh, it's so, it's, uh, the timing is, is uncanny. It's, you, you heard, like I said, on Monday, you hear from Dr. Allen warning everyone, strongly encouraging everybody, even if no mandates, wear a mask. This thing is dangerous. It's not good for kids. It's a serious disease. You don't want to take a chance. I mean, he, he, it was a great interview. Uh, and on Tuesday, the DOE <laughs> responds and says, uh, we're, we're yeah. removing the mask mandate. And again, as I said earlier, Doc, the quarantine, uh, you don't, if you, if you contract or if you're exposed to COVID uh, in school, if, if the source of the exposure was in the classroom, then there is no quarantine. You return back to school. Oh. So you can try to infect yeah. even more students. Uh, so we can try to get the package deal and get the whole class and the teacher 
infected. I, I, I find that, you know, coming from an epidemiologist like Dr. Kemble, I was quite surprised. Uh, I was, I was you know, I, quite surprised. It, I perceive that she didn't look too happy in making that announcement. So, we, you know, we have no transparency about what goes on in the Department of Health discussions. Um, unlike, you know, the IPCC, when it puts out its report on climate change, it gives a dissenting viewpoints. We never hear what any kind of dissenting viewpoints there are from within the Department of Health. It would be helpful to see a variety. And the same thing goes with the CDC. You know, when they come out with this new recommendation, we don't have, see any report of people that didn't think it was a good idea from within the CDC. <laughs> Um, you know, I, I want to just, yeah, Dr. go on. Real quick, before I forget, Dr. Char, in her last television interview that I saw, which was about a month or six weeks ago, they asked her, and she said it was always the Department of Health's position to keep the mask, mm -hmm. the indoor masking going. But we, she said this, quote, we are not the policy makers, unquote. So basically, she told us without telling us, we told them they're just not listening. Yeah, and that that is a shame. Well, I mean, look at the spotlight with the three Democratic governor candidates. Each one of them said they were against the kids masking in schools. Yeah. And Kai Kahele says if he were governor, he would end it immediately. Right. Yeah, I was kind of surprised. Quite you know, surprised. so yeah, I thought, you know, if I were on that, if I were governor candidate, what would have been my answer? I would have said, look, these Public health policies are involve are involve scientific decisions, and they need to be made with expertise. And I, uh, I wouldn't make, uh, I wouldn't just come up with a decision about the mask mandates. I would find what the best scientific advice is from our experts of public health. That was how I would answer it. Um, but yeah. no, it's, each of them said I would personally get rid of the mask mandate for the kids. Uh, without giving any scientific basis. Yeah. yeah. And and Doc, uh, Josh Green said the same thing. Um, and and he's a, he is a doctor, supposedly. So, you know, it's it's frustrating that these people are already not listening to what's happening around the world, are, they're not paying attention. And uh, they're, they're just really going after the vote, right? They're trying to be popular, they, and they, in their mind, they believe there are more voters that want to see the, the mandates go away than those that want to see them remain. That's how they assess it, and they respond accordingly. I think you're right. Your, your uh, response is the correct response, number one, because the governor isn't in a position to make health decisions. That's why you have a Department of Health. And um, yeah, that would have been my response. You know, I would have, I would have, honestly, I would have handed over all the policy making as it related to COVID to the Department of Health and give them the uh, the, the freedom and the comfort that that they could make those decisions without any retribution from anyone in, in elected office. But obviously, politics rule, and people die. People died because of it. And that's that's the, un, the unfortunate thing. So, you know, as to, you know, so what is a, a parent whose kid is going to go to school after August 1st and they're really worried about their kids getting infected? What what are they to do? And, um, you know, so when you see the, the society around you doing going off the rails from your perspective, I mean, this is a, a um, you know, a perennial problem of individuals within a larger society having to decide what to do is, I mean, two things come to my mind. All right. Yeah, one of the, is basically do, do the, do the right thing and uh, don't, don't self censor about doing the right thing. And I think, so one of the things you can do is certainly have your, your kid wear a mask and make sure, and, you know, make sure it's a tight fitting, well fitting. Uh, it, KF 94 is probably the best mask for children. They're made in Korea. Uh, N95s aren't made for kids in the U.S. because they're supposed to be only for workplaces, and you know you don't want kids in dangerous workplaces. So that's why they don't exist for kids in this country. So I would make sure to have them one one way mask as protect as as well as they can, uh, because remember you're basically sending your kid into a COVID ward 
if there's other kids in that classroom and they need to be as every well as protected as as a doctor working in a covid ward and the secondly um one of the things you can do is is measure the ventilation and uh you know send your kid to school with a with a co2 monitor now some of these are very you know they're they're not cheap uh, they all cost uh, you know north of hundred dollars but um, if you can afford it uh, or maybe set up a collective among among the, the the families at a school to share a co2 monitor where uh, you can see how how well the ventilation is working in that classroom because if you if you can keep the if the co2 is less than like less than 600 you got really good ventilation and the and the aerosol can't build up if it's above a thousand that means you know your built every breath your kid is taking is is breathing somebody's a certain fraction of somebody's untreated breath unclean breath and so that's a good measure and that uh, and and then um if you give them a mini corsi rosenthal box all right <laughs> this if you if you equip them so you can make a portable air cleaner and give it to give it to your child and have them take it into the class and say i'm i want to plug this in and run it during the class uh to help protect the air uh, to help protect me and the classmates uh, of course you know we i can imagine they would run into objections from the teachers um but i think it would be it, it would be a good exercise an educational a teachable moment to see how they respond to somebody who's actually trying to improve the air in their classroom. And uh, so, you know, these are things that would help to protect kids, uh, your, your own kid and the, and the other children in the classroom. And, and they should be done. And uh, if, if your child is, um, is willing to, to, uh, to take such uh, uh, actions, I, I think it would be good uh against this negligence that the current situation is so that the recent uh, Depart department of education board meeting um the the holly hawaii group has been trying to get ventilation on the agenda and they couldn't so they're not even doing anything um to try to improve the ventilation in the classrooms it's not even on the agenda and so uh that you know how do you um that's that's obviously that's not that's not right and so what do you do in the face of that well incremental uh, incremental actions to, pr to protect the individual air for your own child and for their own classroom that's steps that can be taken thanks doc um <clears throat> i know there's a petition going around if any one of you uh in the village can post the link uh in the comments and I would ask all the viewers to go ahead and sign that petition. I signed it. I uh, signed it as well. I mean, like, I cannot believe we got to go get a petition to get the DOE to make sure the air quality for the kids that they are endangering with their stupid decision to take the masks off. Uh, we got to go get a petition. I cannot believe that the legislature, I cannot believe that <clears throat> our governor, lieutenant governor, and everybody that, that is in some policymaking position can, are not standing up and saying we got to make sure the ventilation is right in every classroom before we remove the mask mandate. Before you even think of removing the mask mandate, we need to make sure that every single classroom in the state has a CO2 monitor and we know that our kids are safe before we can even discuss lifting. No, everyone is just riding the wave to the election, keeping it all calm so so no controversy and 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 August 1st, our kids uh, go back to school in an unsafe environment. Our teachers will be in an unsafe environment. I am shocked that the HSTA is going to allow this to happen <clears throat> without putting up a fight. I, I am. I mean, I, honestly, if I had my kid, if my kid was still in school, I would homeschool. I, I would. I mean, that's people, you can call me paranoid. You can call me a, a, an idiot, whatever. I'm not going to put my kid and again. My mother-in-law is 86 years old. I don't want my mother-in-law to get COVID because my kid went to school and picked up a virus and brought it home. I, I, I'm just, I would not, not let that happen. The other thing, mark my word, this is what's going to happen. And the DOE should know this. When you have your kid go to school, 
with a mask. There's going to be that jackass in that classroom that's going to bully him or her. That's going to make fun of him and her or him or her because they're wearing a mask. It's going to happen. And the DOE is well aware of that. And basically, they're going to just let your kid have to deal with it. Your kid is either going to fight or he's going to, or she's going to remove the mask and, and become vulnerable to this virus. They all understand that this is what's going to happen, yet they made the decision uh, to, to really put your kids in harm's way. I am frustrated. I am pissed off. And I'm even more mad that no one, no one, no one in any position of authority is standing up for our kids um hsta can't do anything until they see specifically what dh is going to do um i i think they already made it clear tyson they made it clear that august 1st it's it's done it's over and uh the we'll see how that goes but anyway doc i apologize man it's way after 8 30 i know uh it's always a pleasure it's always a joy it's always informative um <clears throat> next week i gotta go get my procedure done at queen's mm. Um, I, I got my call yesterday. I saw the Queens Hospital. I thought they were going to call me to postpone it because they're filled with people and they don't have, but mm -hmm. no, they just called me to remind me of my procedure. But we will be back on, on the following week, Doc. Uh, I'm going to ask you and Dr. Brown to come on again and uh, discuss the numbers in two weeks. Uh, I'll shoot off the email and hopefully you guys are available. But um, just want to say thank you man yeah you always, thank you, you always you always bring bring the the, the beef and i love it <laughs> it's, uh, we always end the show with more knowledge than we started and that's all we can ask for and uh i appreciate the village Any, anything you want to say before we we uh wrap this up doc yeah when you see evil happening around you uh you know one of the principles of that gandhi used to help get india independent from the British Empire was that you don't cooperate with it. And I'd say, uh, if you do the right thing and people should be monitoring the CO2 in the classrooms and they should be purifying the air, uh, make sure that happens um, and you know, let, them, let them try to stop you from, from doing what's needed. And I think that, that would create teachable moments, but, and certainly, non-cooperation could be involved going back to homeschooling if you can manage it but uh but i see this as a is a you know an extraordinary delusion and a madness of crowds taking over the public health policy in the middle of this pandemic and uh and it shouldn't you know you shouldn't cooperate with it Well said, Doc. Thank you again. I appreciate you all. Um, guys, uh, Friday night we'll have Kimberly Hope, the, the violinist, uh, world-renowned. Mm. She's awesome. Kawhi girl, she's going to tell her story, and uh, it's going to be awesome. I can promise you that you are not going to be disappointed. Uh, so please join us on Friday night. Uh, please stay safe, everyone. If you guys get any quick teachable moments, absolutely, Mark. Uh, this, this is information that you will get nowhere else. So make sure all of you, every single one of you on right now, share it. Hit the share button. It's on YouTube. Share it there as well, wherever you can share it. It's really important that we inform and educate everyone uh, with information that is that is scientific and, and accurate and not this political fallacies that you're hearing from everywhere else. All right, guys. Doc, again, thank you, Village. We love you guys. Mm -hmm. We'll see you guys on Friday night. Aloha. Take care. God bless. Aloha.